President Gerald R. Ford would have turned 100 years old in 2013. A centennial celebration and wreath-laying ceremony were held on his birthday. July 14th marked the occasion. Historian and Pulitzer Prize-winning author John Meacham was there. We talk about the 38th president, his impact, and legacy on newsmakers. John Meacham, you are a Pulitzer Prize winning author and historian. Recent book is uh, Thomas Jefferson, The Art of Power. Thanks for joining us. I appreciate this. Thanks for having me. Um, Gerald R. Ford. This will having be... me in your cabinet room. Yes, I love our cabinet room here. This is beautiful. Gerald R. Ford uh, would turn 100 this year. And uh, there's always been much debate over his place as president. He was the 38th president. We're now up to 44. As you study this man, and we go back to his time in office, which we had high unemployment and uh, inflation. The Vietnam War was beginning to wind down a bit. Watergate. When you put all that into context, where do you place him among presidents? He was an uncommon president at an uncommon time. Uh, no one ever reached the office the way he did. Very few people conducted themselves in the way in which he conducted himself once he got there. It was almost as though he believed because he had reached it in different hours of crisis, he had nothing to lose. And the worst thing that could happen to him was he lose the election. And he did, barely. But one of the wonderful things, I think, about Gerald Ford and also about George H.W. Bush right now uh, which is also shared by President Truman, who's, who's right over there, is these are men who left Washington after defeat with the country looking askance at what they had done. But with the perspective of time, the country came to see that what they had done had actually been for the long-term good. And I think that President Ford belongs in that class with Truman and with Bush of men who made difficult decisions in real time, who knew they were difficult decisions, but were willing to take the risk of judgment. And I think that his historical stock will, has been rising and will continue to. There's a piece that you wrote um, after uh, Gerald Ford's death um, in 2006. It may have been written in early 2007, but you write about the defining moment of a president. Mm -hmm. I believe it was, it was on a Sunday morning it was at 11 a.m. It was, uh, it was 11.04 uh, on that Sunday in uh, uh, September 1974. He's gone to church at St. John's Lafayette Square right across the, right across the way, past statue of Andrew Jackson. Uh, came back over and pardoned Richard Nixon for any and all crimes committed or he may have committed against the United States between Inauguration Day 1969 and the 9th of August 1974. There's an exhibit in the museum about showing where the Gallup poll, where his number was before that announcement and where it was after. And he really never fully politically recovered from that. What was wonderful, I think, for a lot of folks was to, for him to have lived so long, to have seen the country see the wisdom of it. Two great moments of that, as you, as you know. One was Bill Clinton, whose wife, the former Secretary of State, now worked on the House Judiciary Committee trying to impeach Richard Nixon, awarding him the Congressional Gold Medal in honor of his political courage. And the other was the uh, John Kennedy Foundation giving him the Profile and Courage Award, which was from John Kennedy's book in the 1950s about leaders who took the risk of judgment, put everything on the line while they were making the decision, knowing they could lose their, their political careers. I don't think there's any question in, there may still be some conspiracists who think there was a deal of some kind and all that. There's no historical evidence for it. Um, he believed that the country had to move on. I think I'm right that 19 out of 23 questions at his first, something like that, uh, at his first press conference were about Nixon and the grand jury. And he thought the country had to move on. And I think the country now sees the wisdom of that. Didn't at the time. But that's what 
leadership is. And I, you wonder, if he had gone through the rigors of a campaign, if he had had to cut the deals that he had to cut to get a nomination and run, would he have made that decision? But he was summoned in such an uncommon way that he was able to do something uncommon. Americans know the famous line, the long national nightmare is over. But it's what comes after right. that is truly deep and meaningful and tells a lot about this man. Right. He believed that he was a servant of God, of a higher power, and that he needed justice and mercy if he were to uh, ex execute these, these formidable duties. The other thing we forget, and you're, you're alluding to it, is remember, this is 1974. Armageddon is on the table. I mean, the Middle East is always boiling over. Terrorism, as we understand it now, is really beginning to become a, a stronger force. A lot of hijackings, a lot of, uh, of non-state actors. But we're facing the Soviet Union at a time when first strike capability on both sides was quite high. Uh, one of the things that Ford, President Ford worried most about in those August days was how to get word to foreign governments that this was not a coup, this was not, you know, that this was an orderly transition. Uh, Secretary Kissinger, I think, was critical in that. And President Ford ended up being quite a good foreign policy president. Again, something you might not have expected from his having been in the House of Representatives for. Um, what, uh, 25 years at that point. How surprising is how all of this took place? He, he, this was not an office that he pursued. No. He was, he was, his goals were much smaller to be the, to be the speaker. Not to be the speaker he of the House. To be the speaker. Uh, he was a man of the House. Uh, there are some people who love the House of Representatives. Tip O'Neill was one, Gerald Ford is one. Uh, he very much wanted, uh, that was his ambition. Um, and I think, again, I think there's something to the fact that he didn't want it that made him better at it uh, to some extent. And, and once he got there, let's be honest, you know, this, the, the, he's, he's mortal. You know, once you get there and, you know, you, you begin to see that the world is running well when you're in charge. I've never, we've had 44 presidents of the United States. Uh, no president has ever thought, you know, I think someone else would really be better at this. <laughs> it's just an occupational hazard. Uh, a political scientist once said that Franklin Roosevelt's conception of the presidency was himself in it. Uh, and a lot of folks have that view. And he wanted to run in 76. Early on, he had not. Uh, Richard Nixon, um, when Nixon asked Ford to be vice president in 1973, Nixon said, I want you to say you will not run in 1976. My candidate is John Connolly, Democrat of Texas, who had just switched parties. You know, just politics turns on a dime. Uh, you look back at that period, and we now know from the first decade of the 21st century because of George W. Bush and his dependence, really, on the 34-year-old White House Chief of Staff, Dick Cheney, on Donald Rumsfeld. Um, George H.W. Bush was the CIA director and the envoy to China. Um, you know, it's, it's this moment of great ferment in the Republican Party, a lot of enormously great talent. And then, in early 1976, Ronald Reagan comes out of California to challenge Gerald Ford for the nomination in what I think any fair-minded person would say was at least not helpful to the general election. No president who has sustained a significant primary challenge like that uh, as an incumbent has triumphed in November. Jimmy Carter learned that the next time when Ted Kennedy did to Carter what Reagan did to Ford. So these were tum tumultuous political days. It's interesting you bring up that cabinet because the names have, have lingered on oh, yeah. throughout the decades. Rumsfeld, Cheney, Kissinger, Coleman, Kissinger, Paul O'Neill, yep. Penn Stein, yep. actor, right. Right? <laughs> right, right? Right, right, But obviously there was something about the way he chose the leadership around him. Well, yes, he knew Washington. He also, he told uh, 
my friend and, and colleague Michael Beschloss that he believes that if he had won the election in 1976, the party would not have moved so far to the right. Uh, now, presumably, if President Ford had defeated Governor Carter in 76, it's hard to see how Ronald Reagan becomes president. You, don't want to be, you get into a lot of what ifs, but it's, it's quite possible that the party would have stayed closer to what Nixon's, uh, what President Ford's vice president, Nelson Rockefeller was, than to what it ultimately has, has become. And a lot of the figures, interestingly, you mentioned, were more moderate Ford, Rockefeller kind of Republicans, Alan Greenspan uh, is another one, uh, in the mid-70s who did move rightward in the ensuing 20 years. Now, People change their views, you want them to in the face of contrary facts, but the combination of Nixon and Ford as the, the great AA, AAA farm team for Reagan, the first Bush, and the second Bush is indisputable. When you look at him, he seemed to be a very caring man, mm -hmm. personally. I, I would imagine he shared that with his staff as well. Yeah. Um, but when we look at him and what he has done over time, how caring was he? Because you see this partisan, the partisanship is always in politics, and right. yet he's the guy who was always reaching across the aisle. Right. Was there this caring element to him? Uh, yes, but let's be, let's be clear. He reached across the aisle, but sometimes he had on a boxing glove. I mean, let's... Uh, he was not Saint Gerald. Uh, he was a political warrior. You do not get to be the House Minority Leader. Uh, you do not get to be. Uh, you know, he gave 200 speeches a year for other Republican candidates. You don't just have someone come in to talk about the virtues of government if you're campaigning. You want somebody to come in to knock your opponent down. And he, the difference is, he was a terrific political warrior. But he was conducting that political warfare in an era when partisanship was not a blood sport. It was, in fact, more, it, at least they wore gloves. Now it's bare knuckled. He, what, where I think his kindness and his caring, to go directly to your question, comes in, and what makes him different from many, many political figures today, is that he knew the difference between an opponent and an enemy and that every opponent was not an enemy. He shared this with Winston Churchill. Churchill was the most magnanimous political figure you can imagine. He forgave Neville Chamberlain. He forgave everybody. He thought he could redeem Stalin. I mean, it was just amazing what he thought he could do. And I once looked at this trying to figure out why. And it's because he had been a legislator for so long that this morning's opponent is this afternoon's ally. Ford spent a quarter century building a coalition around issue X before lunch, and two or three guys may hate you on that. But then after lunch, when you're doing issue Y, those two or three guys are with you, and the guys who, you know, the other guys were somewhere else. I think the legislative mindset, when it's being used correctly and, and being applied correctly, gives you a kind of Fordian, if you will, vision of pragmatism. Politics is about, and I just went through this with Thomas Jefferson, politics is about building coalitions of opinion in real time to resolve issues for a given period of time. There are very few votes that will echo until the end of the English language. There are some going into World War II, uh, ending slavery. That's two. How many votes happen all the time? And Great legislators are the ones, and great presidents ultimately, are the ones who know when to get really hot about something and when to know that, you know what, this afternoon I'm going to need that guy, so let's not cut his head off yet. Integrity is a word that often is yeah. attached with Gerald Ford, but there are many characteristics that go along with the word integrity. So when you kind of peel the onion back when yeah. we talk about integrity. What are those components when we, when we dissect Gerald Ford? Well, what I think is remarkable about a man who in that era, 
spent a quarter century in Congress and then two years as president, a year or two as vice president, is not a whiff of personal scandal. Uh, you know, he comes in, Watergate is abuse of power, uh, abuse of office, abuse of trust. Gerald Ford's worst enemy never said anything uh, about his keeping his word, his, his, his personal honesty, his personal probity. I remember when, when, when George H.W. Bush eulogized him in, um, would have been 06, late 06, early 07, he said about the Warren Commission and the Kennedy assassination, I believe it was a lone gunman because Gerald Ford told me so. And Gerald Ford's word was good. That's from a guy who sat in the chair you sat in and knew you pretty well. And I think that speaks volumes about that kind of personal steeliness and a kind of personal honesty. Very hard to find people who will say, you know what, that guy screwed me over. Not hard to find any in people in politics who will say that. But I've never run across someone who said, you know, Gerald Ford just stabbed me in the back. That just didn't happen. I think when people live in an area, they take it for granted. Um, I'm not from here, I'm a transplant, but I love West Michigan. And I think there are some real reasons why this is a great place to raise a family and to live here. Gerald Ford growing up in Grand Rapids, how, how did that help to shape who he became as a man and as a leader? Well, my understanding is perfect Midwestern Eagle Scout, straightforward, um, American, America has a role to play in the world. Uh, remarkable that he had a more internationalist vision. Uh, you know, the first congressman, he, the incumbent he beat, uh, Yankman, was an isolationist. And this part of it, Michigan has always sort of been a bellwether in terms of how engaged the United States should be around, around the world. There, were, there have been periods of isolation, but then there have been periods of engagement, and Ford fell on the engagement side. I think his personal story is something that we should mention because, you know, Gerald Ford is one of four presidents who either, whose name is not given, whose birth name is not that, or who really didn't know their father. Uh, Andrew Jackson never knew his father. Bill Clinton never knew his father, and Bill Clinton was born in another name. Uh, Jefferson's father died before he was 14. Uh, Washington's father died early. President Obama saw his father once in his life, and Gerald Ford saw his father, I think once, maybe twice. Um, and his stepfather was the one, as in the Clinton case, who, who, who stepped in and raised him. It's funny, historically, Presidents tend to either come from more than usually chaotic family backgrounds, which President Ford fits into, or ones with very strong fathers, Adamses, Bushes, Kennedys, Roosevelts. Um, I think, without practicing psychiatry without a license too egregiously, I think the fact that President Ford, to some extent, had to make himself into his own man. All the love of the stepfather, the powerful mother, all of that is, is there. But imagine what it was like when he was, what, 15, 16 years old, I think, and he's making, you know, he's working in the diner, and a man walks in and says, I'm your father. You want to go to lunch? I mean, it just, it, it makes your head swim. Uh, the, the emotional storm that must have created. He writes about it. He writes about how he cried himself to sleep that night. Um, and I think that whether it was Michigan, whether it was the people he knew, the scout leaders, the coaches, they were strong where that initial father was weak and helped him become someone who ultimately became a father of the country. Does that strength, tell, it just seems like the snapshot of that strength and becoming your own man is when he's playing football at U of M, and it may have also have guided him when it came to civil rights as well. 
that he takes a stand. And he knew, yeah, right, he played on an integrated team. Uh, I think that, yes, I, I, if you're confident in yourself, then you will take more confident positions, more confident, uh, uh, more courageous, hopefully, uh, positions. And again, for a long time, all he had to worry about was the fifth district of Michigan. And so the people of Grand Rapids, the people of his district, the, the country owes a great debt to them because if they hadn't approved of what he'd done all those years, he would not have been in a position to step into ultimate authority to shape the destiny of so many other people. And so clearly his good sense was linked to the good sense of the people who elected him, or they wouldn't have kept electing him. What was his true role in civil rights? We know Ford comes from a different tradition than the contemporary Republican Party in 2013. Uh, he came out of a world in which, in 1960, Richard Nixon carried 32 percent of the African American vote against John Kennedy. I think I'm right in saying that Mitt Romney carried about 2 percent. Um, so Ford was no Lyndon Johnson uh, on civil rights but he was a much more moderate figure in, in terms of the, in the way we would think of it. And, and I think a fair-minded a fair minded man. He served in the Navy, World yep. War II. Again, that leadership that comes out. And told me once that if Truman had not uh, dropped the atomic bomb, he might not have been there to sit and have the conversation. Uh, he was one of those who believed that he would have uh, possibly died in the invasion of the home islands. Uh, I think it's, it's hard, Tom Brokaw, who so brilliantly referred to them as the greatest generation, they really were. I mean, it was an, ama it was an immense contribution and, and happened overnight, very American. You know, we, we, we dragged our feet, we were not where we should have been prior to 1941, given German aggression. We didn't even declare war on Germany until Germany declared war on us four days after Pearl Harbor. But once we, once this giant awoke, uh, it was men like Gerald Ford, it was men like George Bush, it was uh, you know, a remarkable cadre, hundreds of thousands of young men who went and really created the world we still live in. And we've got a, a, a new generation of aircraft carrier, the first one right. named after this president. Right, right, the Eisenhower, the Bush, the Ford. I think it's great, I think it's, it's fun. I don't know if you feel this way, I feel I'm getting old now that I know I know more and more of the oil portraits. <laughs> more and more of the aircraft carriers are people I knew. <laughs> uh, Betty Ford, we cannot uh, end no. this conversation no. without talking about the no. meaning of, of her and Gerald's life, and especially when you think she was just the homemaker and then thrust onto the Boy, national stage. As important as Dolly Madison was, you know, when Dolly Madison saved everything in the White House, uh, the difference is Betty Ford put subjects took subjects out of the shadows and put them on the kitchen table and the dining room table where they belonged. Uh, I don't know how many lives have been changed by her center's work on addiction, uh, but it's, it's an immense legacy, as important as any first lady in history. In the last uh, minute here, what is that, that legacy for you, for this country that Gerald Ford leaves behind? Uh, I think if we can recover his sense that politics is an honorable profession, if we can recover his sense that we do have to embrace the world, and that we can cooperate without singing kumbaya, that there is in fact an art of compromise that can be principled. It's not that we just cut a deal for a deal's sake, but Gerald Ford's legacy in the House and as president was one of principled pragmatism. So was Thomas Jefferson's, so was Andrew Jackson's, so was Abraham Lincoln's, so was Franklin Roosevelt's. It's a noble tradition and Gerald Ford belongs in it. John Meacham, thank you so much. Thank you, appreciate it.